see all of you out here this evening, all bright and cheery. Just full of yourselves. Feeling good. I'm glad you do. That's the way it should be. Shouldn't. We have sad days, we have happy days. We've all had some some of both. But it's good days. Really good days. We're going to go into Second Peter uh, this evening. And you've got a little something for tonight, a little outline. And it's uh, something that we'll get going started on. I found this book in my bunches of books that I had today. Adventuring in Young America. It was a textbook. Uh-huh. I got one. Yeah, very good one. This one's in good good shape. This is the Lavasia School, wherever that is. Have no idea. I don't guess I owe the library uh, anything on it. I'm not sure. I hope not. <laughs> 1945. <laughs> 1941-1945. And uh, this was quite interesting. This was the Danes School. And notice a little boy in the corner with the little dunce hat on. <laughs> <laughs> little fellow right here. He apparently was a smart aleck in class and didn't do his work or something and didn't work out. But I'm just reading on this and it talks about churches in the pioneer times. Man, we're wimps. <laughs> My goodness. A lot of the people their houses and the taverns and the businesses, all the buildings looked similar, so you didn't know until you saw the gathering as to which group was meeting for the places of meeting. But it said when services were held by the occasional minister, because most of them couldn't have a full-time minister, they just didn't have them. The people generally gathered in large numbers. This was probably not entirely due to religious interest, however. So little happened on the frontier that people were anxious about anything any stranger had to say. So they would turn out in crowds to see and hear him. They came long distances, some in ox carts, some on horseback, and many on foot. Whole families often walked six, eight, or even ten miles to attend a meeting. They would walk barefoot in the summer, carry their shoes, only putting them on before they entered the meeting place. When a pair of shoes had to last a year, the people could not afford to wear them out walking so far. It talks so much about the church services. Pioneer conditions tended to make the services much more simple than they had been in colonial times. As the years passed and the pioneers moved further west, the former services gradually changed. The sermon was generally about an hour long. It often caused people to become excited. There was a mourner's bench at the front row of every church. This was a seat directly in front of the minister. And when the people were overcome with a sense of their own sins, they went forward and sat there. The sermon was considered good if it filled the mourner's bench. <laughs> The musical instruments were not found until later times, so the tune was raised by someone with a good voice who could sing. The men sat on one side, the women sat on the other, the small children sat with their mothers, but as soon as the boys were old enough, they would go on the other side and sit with their fathers. At any rate, it just goes on and on about pioneer preachers, camp meetings and such things as that, and what they were like. And it, I thought it was very interesting that this was a history book. This was not a religious school book. This was a history book. Government and the colonies, tra travel, transportation, colonial children, food, times. Of, but all these things, they've been lost and forgotten. I've got another book I haven't been able to find. I think it's at the house where I talked about when Whitfield preached that there'd be a cloud of dust. You could see it for miles. You'd think there's a dust storm coming. People coming to get the Word of God. And I thought about this. My wife and I talked about it this morning. America is so saturated with churches, saturated with Bibles, saturated with internet, saturated with TV and radio preachers, saturated with schools, 
and the society is so saturated that society is sick of God. Not because God is bad, it's because society just pushes back, pushes back, and pushes back so much as Psalm 2 verses 1 through 3 says. And in, as a case, as is the case of so many things has happened, a lot of deadly sins have entered the church, as this old book tells us, the church of our fathers. Greed, anger, luxury, gluttony, pride, and so forth. And this, this book here has some interesting reads as well. It's more liturgical in nature. But there's so much that is our, our history and, and but we, it always the answer is always get back to the Bible, getting back to the Bible, and that's our goal is to stay in it. There's no need to leave it. If we leave it, then we've left the Lord because you can't separate the two. They're to get they're entwined. And we'll see that in this letter. Second Peter, you've got a little outline down there. It's not extensive, but it gives you a little breakdown of this letter. Peter reminds the saints, chapter 1. Peter warns the sinners, chapter 2. And Peter warns the saints, chapter 3. Pretty basic. Then there's a little breakdown, as you can see there, where we have the verses broken down somewhat. I don't necessarily stick to all those. Obviously, I don't do that. But it's a little breakdown of those divisions. So maybe you can parse something from that. So Second Peter. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you help us tonight to benefit from this study, to benefit from the truth, to benefit from your guidance, your care, and your love, that we'll always benefit from your Spirit giving us an understanding of the truth and how it applies to our life, and how it's such a wonderful privilege to be able to meet together like we do, not ever taking that for granted and to study a portion of the Word before it's gone. Heavenly Father, we know in Your Word, if You said that You would remove Your Word in Amos chapter 8, Your prophet said that You could remove the Word where the people couldn't find it anywhere. You find a lot of other stuff, but not the Word. And that's what we always seem to seek as the deer pants after the water brook, so pants my heart after Thee, O Lord. So also, Heavenly Father, help us to have our feet set out of the miry clay and on a solid rock and put a song in our hearts as people might see you and love you and fear you and reverence you again. Father, help us as we study Second Peter to glean from these teachings. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, you've got the notes there. In Peter's first epistle, and it was not written too awful long before the second. The first one is said to be written in 65 A.D., the second one in 66. So they were pretty close together, somewhere in that area. In first epistle, letter of Peter, he spoke throughout the letter to the believer's witness before the world. In the second letter, Peter speaks to the believer's warning against false teachers. So in the second letter, he warns against the heresy of false teachers. He warns against the godless society. In the first epistle, he speaks to the believer's godliness. And in the second letter, he speaks to the godless society we live in. In the first letter, Peter addresses the trials and sufferings that come from outside the church, mostly undeserved suffering. But in the second letter, letter Peter addresses... Against the, the believer against the trials and false teachings that come from outside and inside the church. Again, the first one is about the sufferings that come from the world upon the Christian. And the second one is the false teachings that try to undermine the Word of God and affect that way the Christian. In the first epistle, Peter puts the emphasis on the living Word and in the second epistle, he puts the emphasis on the written word. Peter ministered with Jesus for three years, so he knew him well. 
though this was some time after that when he wrote this. Both the living and the written word is going to be attacked until the end of time. That's just the way it is. Satan will attack the word of God and as he is let out of the bottomless pit for a thousand years, Satan is going to attack the word of God. And the faithful believer will always be caught in the middle. If you stand for the Word of God, you will be caught in the middle. Just chalk it up. Don't act shocked. Don't feel like, well, I don't know if I want to be in that much of a Bible-centered teaching church. I'd rather be in more of an activity-centered church that has some Bible where you've got your priorities wrong then. I've got my priorities wrong then. That's putting the cart before the horse. We may suffer in many ways in the Christian life. And we will. But as Peter said in his first letter, if we are reproached for the name of Christ, be happy for the Spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. Kind of a privilege. It's, it's, it's part of your identity. Suffering can come from living the truth. And here's the opposite of that. Sometimes suffering comes from living the truth. But this kind of suffering brings God's blessing. And this is always a comfort to the spirit of the believer. It may not be a comfort to the pocketbook. may not be a comfort to the health. may not be a comfort to your circle of family and friends. But it sure is a comfort to your spirit. I don't know if you've ever had an experience or lived the experience, hopefully you do, where your spirit is the one that's comforted more than your flesh or your mind. Because you can get through anything if your spirit is comforted by God in the Word. Sometimes suffering results from lacking the truth. I don't know if I've got enough room to... Yeah, I almost got in there. Sometimes suffering comes from lacking the truth. And this is always confusing to so many believers. Suffering because we didn't know right from wrong. I don't talk about just morals, but just from the Bible and what to expect. This is always confusing to the believer. And so Peter addresses this as he ends this letter in chapter 3 and verse 18 where he says, But grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He put that in, in the imperative mood, present tense, so it's a continuous action. We're to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And the word there for knowledge, and this is the word knowledge as we'll see, and know is used a lot in this third, this second epistle. But sometimes we suffer because we lack the truth and we go about our way because we don't know any different. And I will tell you as a pastor, one of the hardest things and the most tenuous things that I experience is waiting on believers to mature so that they know the truth and they go forward with the truth uh, with with knowledge. Knowledge takes time. So how much time? Depends on how much you want to do. Because we can get caught up in so many things. There's so many false teachings and this tr this book deals a lot with false teachings. You can get caught up with a lot of false teachings. I can get caught up with false teachings and end up finding myself uh, being becoming confused. There are a lot of false teachers out there, as it says in 1 John chapter 4. They're already here, he says. So those problems are addressed. When it comes to being a faithful believer, it's not just being faithful to the gospel, it's also being faithful to learning the truth, the, the word of God. And when it means being faithful, it means that it gets down to our understanding and our obedience to Christ and His Word. And so we keep learning, we keep growing. And Peter is trying to prepare his people because in this book, he's down at the end of his life. He may have another year to live. Maybe. He's got a family. He mentions in chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, if you look there, Knowing that shortly I must put off my tabernacle. That's his body. His soul is talking. His spirit's talking. My body's going to get laid to the side. Actually, upside down. 
even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath shown me. He would told him that he would die. That's in John chapter 21, verses 18 and 19. It's Peter believes in the inspiration of Scripture because he knows who inspired it. And in John chapter 21, verses 18 and 19, Jesus Christ told him that he would he would have his time and it would end. It, it, that was going to be it. He would he would suffer. Paul was told that was going to happen to him too by the Lord when the Lord had him. John 21, 18, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest where thou wouldest. Jesus talking to Peter. This is after the three, if you love me, feed my sheep uh, conversation that Jesus had with Peter. John 21, 18, again, Verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, Alathia, Alathia, the word there for verily or truly, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself to walk where you wanted to. But when you, thou shalt be old, Thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and shall carry thee where you would is not. This he spoke signifying by what death Peter should, that he should glorify God. He's talking about he's going to be crucified. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, Follow me. Of all the gall, you're telling me I'm going to die for you, and now you're telling me to follow you. Now this is the resurrected Christ talking to him. And he did. He followed. He followed me, and he did. Followed him all the way to his cross. Talking about bearing your cross, his cross bore him. So Peter's at the end of his life at this time. He knew his time on earth was short. Back to Second Peter 1, 14, knowing that surely I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you will may be able after my departure or my decease or death to have these things always in remembrance. Peter wants the believer to stay in remembrance of the things of which he instructs them. Remembrance is used several times. Even in chapter 1, it's already seen in chapter 1 and verse 12. I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance. And then he goes back in verse 15 and says, I'm going to, I want you to remember these things. Recall them. Call them to mind. Now this letter was written between 66 and 67 A.D. just prior to Jude's epistle that was written. Jude being the half-brother of our Lord Jesus. The son of, another son of Mary. But not the virgin son but like Jesus, but a son of Mary. And this was written just prior to Jude's epistle as we see in Jude a further development of the thoughts that Peter had regarding apostasy which is mentioned somewhat in Peter's second epistle in chapter 2. So Jude and Second Peter have a lot of similarities. And those guys hung out together. They were both Jewish. They were both there in Jerusalem. They were both brought up of course, Jude being even more brought up with Jesus, his brother. But either way, uh, he and Peter had a close relationship. And they addressed some of the same issues of apostasy. So that was that was important there. This is an intro. So, <clears throat> as far as the themes go in this letter, we see that the word no and its cognates of the word gnosis or knowledge is, occurs 16 times in this letter. The emphasis, of course, is on your understanding and spiritual awareness. So let me give you those if you don't have those. Chapter 1, okay? Verse 2, verse 3, verse 5, verse 6, verse 8, verse 12, verse 14, and verse 16. And verse 20. Chapter 1, verse 2, 3, 5, 6, 8, 12, 14, 16, and 20. And in chapter 2, verses 9, 20, and in 21, twice. In chapter 3, verses 3, 17, and 18. So as we have said so many times, the greatest deterrent to error is knowledge. It's truth. That's the greatest deterrent to error. God's truth must be kept 
before us and often we have to have reminders. That's why it says in chapter 3 and verse 17, Be ye therefore beloved, seeing that ye know these things before. Beware lest ye also being led away with the air of your wickedness fall from your own steadfastness. The answer to falling away, the answer to keep from falling away, and the answer to keep from being led by error is to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Not strike up the band. So many of these churches are teetering on apostasy. I'm not saying all of them, but a lot of them are teetering on apostasy. And their people are hanging on by a thread. You do not have to hang on by a thread. You should not have to eat potted meat when you can have steak. You spend all this money and all this time on making a nice dessert, a nice big old cake, nice big old pies, all these sweets. And then you give somebody a Vienna sausage for their sustenance. That's pretty much what a lot of churches are doing. Shame on those people. I like many sausages. But I like a good steak every once in a while too. Anywho. Potted meat. You don't know what's in that thing. <laughs> Speaking of potted meat, I have to bring this out. This is not potted meat. I've been seeing a lot of stuff lately on Facebook. I don't like to look at it much. I don't. It's just junk now. It's it's mostly all junk now. I don't know what's happened. But there's been this strong push on there that this woman back in late 17, early 1800s started the the theory of the rapture from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 where Paul said they're teaching a false teaching about that the Lord has already come. As if the day of the Lord had already come. But first there would have to be the first appearing of the Antichrist. That falling away first, the Antichrist. Well, this person says, well, the church has got to go through the tribulation period. And all these people said in this group that those who believe in the rapture of the church are the apostates. That because you believe that Jesus is going to rapture at the church, there's going to be a seven year tribulation period on earth, that there's going to be the second coming of Christ and a thousand year reign of Christ, that those who teach this thing, that we're the apostates. And it's spreading because people are ignorant. They're not taught these doctrines, they're not laid out. What it means, how Jewish the scriptures are. So here we got, oh no, this one here. <laughs> I feel like going out and making a bunch of copies. And y'all know that stuff. Y'all pretty well are versed at it, and that's good. But every once in a while, you've got to defend it. You've got to tell people about it. So if you want to make a copy of this before you go, if you don't have it already, I'm sure you got the notes somewhere. But here's just a, a snapshot of it. So anyway, I won't get into all that, but Peter had to deal with people who were telling him, as Paul had to also defend the doctrine, Jude in particular defended the defense of the doctrine in Jude 1, I think verse 3, because there was such apostasy in there over a lot of issues that we're dealing with in our America today. But uh, there is such a great contrast between tribulation believers and church age believers. And so this little paper here, somebody wants to make some copies in this little room here, there's some in there. Might be something else in there too. I don't know. So anyway, there's just so much error that's going on out there. There's these new doctrines that is neo-Gnosticisms coming out. There's these teachings of the Pentecostals that are very strong dealing with that God is going to give you a word of faith and it's just like it's inspired word of God. These preachers, they're trying to have these ministries where they're saying things that are not coming out of the Bible. They're just hucksters is what they are. They're just criminal as, and really they're actually criminal in what they're doing and duping the people and they're getting rich off of them. There's so much false teaching out there and this idea that you can live any way that you want as a Christian and it's okay is, uh, is, um, um, is just crazy. Paul said, God forbid. The greatest deterrent to error is to know the truth. 
And so when these people, if they're truly saved, get they will get raptured, they're going to be shocked that they were so belligerent about it, not knowing that the truth that Jesus is not going to put you through something that he went through at Calvary. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. They don't believe in eternal security. They just are dumb. But if they quote a KJV verse, that automatically trumps everything. It trumps all theology. It trumps all knowledge of higher and lower criticism. It trumps everything when it comes to systematic theology. Just because you think you quote something from a particular version of the Bible does not mean that you know the Bible. I had a man one time that just swore up and down that that was the way it was. He was bragging about it. I won't say who, who it was. And didn't know the fact that the book that he was giving me to show me, I wish I got the whole set in there. Uh, he was showing me, it was a commentary. The whole commentary was based on the NIV. And it's written right on the bridge of the book. It's written right on the back of it. And I showed it to this person, and this person says, What? Yeah, and that's okay. Because it was a good commentary. <laughs> <laughs> and I still use them today. Good commentary. Based on the truth. <clears throat> some people use the Nestle's text, some use the Westcott Hort text, and that was part of the big difference right there. But anyway, depends on which manuscripts they each one used separately. But anyway, the greatest deterrent to error is knowing the truth. And so we have to keep the truth before us, and so we have to have reminders, as Peter says. So that's called inculcation, repetition of teaching. Repetition of teaching. You might say, I've heard that before, I've heard that before. But it's good to be reminded. Because the only way that you sustain spiritual momentum is that you don't forget what you've learned. You cannot forget it. These are the rudiments of the faith. If we forget basic biblical principles, we get into trouble. Because we fail to pick up on those little subtle hints that something is wrong when the, those false teachers start spouting their things that seem nice. Things that seem reasonable. Because humanists and religion and cults are always postulating things that sound feasible or reasonable or rational. But they're not always biblical. They're not always correct. Truth often takes a back seat to sentimentalism when it is couched in good deeds and laid on thick. I've seen that all my life. Truth often takes a back seat to sentimentalism when it, that truth affects what people are doing. They don't want to bring it out. And so they have to leave the truth in the background. In the Bible, for so many churches, it's just a fixture in the storefront window. That's not at all what goes on once you get inside. Ecumenism or interdenominationalism. In other words, you, you let up on what you do and you let up on what you do and see if we can get along. You can't have a conscience towards what you believe the Bible to say. You have a right to have a conscience to what you believe the Bible says. As long as you studied it and that's what you believe, then that's what you believe. I'm not here to change that. I'm just here to teach what I believe and what I understand. And I'm here to defend it. I'm not here to argue with it. I'm here to teach it. That's apologetics. Sunday school teachers really, when they got kids in their classes, we've got Sunday school teachers in here, when you've got kids in your classes and they start asking you questions about something, they can put you on your toes real quick. I mean, I taught Sunday school here for 15 years before I started teaching the adults. So I know what that was like teaching young people. And I was kind of young, too. I was in my 20s. I thought I was all that in a bag of chips. I was just a bag. <laughs> bag of hot air sometimes. But I did study hard. God, I did study hard. And I had a good teacher. <laughs> But when you learn the word, you pick up on the subtle hints that something's just fishy about this. Seems like a good idea. Seems like the right thing to do. 
But after you grow in the Word and you start thinking, you start putting two and two together, you, you're not cynical. You're smart. You're not being cynical. You're being biblical. You say, well, this is a nice thing. That's a nice thing. Cults postulate nice things. People look into... Uh, cultivate a group to themselves. Everyone that followed Jim Jones and the guy in Africa thought, this guy's got it together. He's like the modern day Messiah. 900 people drank the Kool-Aid. I guess it was cyanide in it. Cyanide. There's some of them buried out here on 604 at Old Dominion uh, huh. Cemetery. Mm -hmm. This is a group of them. They sent them to different places. They didn't know what was coming. The guy that convinced the people that they would drink the poison to get on the Hell Bob Comet. A freak show. People believe a lot of things. That's how people get involved in cults. You got a little bit of truth and a whole lot of lies. Just enough truth used as a skin to cover the lie. Truth often takes a back seat when people get sentimental. When that an idea or something is couched in a good deed or laid on thick. Ecumenism or interdenominational, interdenominationalism, and get into more of the structure organized church, is the endeavor of Christian name brand churches who want to unite apart from doctrinal clarification. So you've got to sacrifice your belief on this, you've got to sacrifice your belief on that, and you've got to do that, and if you do that, we'll get along. Eventually, you got no truth at all because you couldn't get along if you were there. That's why I don't get involved in ecumenical movements. I don't get involved in ecumenical this, that, or the other. This interdenominational stuff. Simply because it's not palatable. A local church has got to be... Now, when it comes to doing and sharing the gospel, sometimes you can get away with that. But not in a local church that's trying to edify a group of believers. Ecumenism is a cancer that eats truth. And it replaces the edifying spiritual work of God with an activity of works of mankind in the name of religion and in the name of Christ. We have to be careful. It's a powerful and it's an intimidating force which is often the gateway for humanism and human good which eventually will overshadow the will and the plan of God dispensational distinctions that type of teaching that we teach and others as well teach is loathed by ecumenists it's loathed by interdenominationalists because it is something that divides the group it is something that divides that church it's rejected flat out world council churches were rejected flat out as, a, as an, an example Distinct errors of God's plans for time, which are clear in the Scripture. Distinct errors of God's time, plans for time, of God moving forward from the Garden of Eden to the end of time. It is rejected of there being distinctions in large part by ecumenists. Rejected. And Peter dealt with it. Flat out rejected. Wickedness always fills the void when righteousness is vacated. Good, human good always fills the void where divine truth is vacated. The errors of wickedness fill the void of our lives when righteous living has been vacated. And you and I know that. That if we're not focusing on good, godly, good things, immoral, ungodly, bad things, we'll try to fill that space. Peter uses the word remembrance four times in this letter. Chapter 1, verse 12, verse 13, and verse 15, and in chapter 3 and verse 1. This second epistle, he says in chapter 3, verse 1, Beloved, I now write unto you, in both of which I stir up your pure minds, not polluted minds, but pure minds, by way of remembrance. If you look down in verse 5, he talks about a group that we're going to talk about. Those people are willingly ignorant. They're willingly ignorant. 
And in verse 8 it says, But beloved, be not ignorant. So he's, he's telling them, you know, straight up, this is what we, what we got coming, this is what we need to look at. So as false teachers were plentiful in the first century church, they taught that the Word of God is not true. They taught that Jesus Christ was not true. They taught that His deity was not true. They taught that His sacrifice was not true. Many taught that He died, but it was not His Spirit that was in the cross, that it left and went back to heaven, and it was only His flesh that went to the cross. That completely takes Isaiah 53 and throws it in the toilet. It all completely takes Psalm 22 and tap tosses it away. So false teachers were plentiful then and false teachers are plentiful today. In Peter's day, false teachers proclaimed great swelling words, empty words as chapter 2 and verse 18 says. He says, for when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, vanity, you know, some people can say something, they can say nothing very well. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, they appeal to people through much wantonness. We'll look at that fancy little word there. Fancy little word. Those that are just escaping from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For whom a man is overcome of the same, he is brought into bondage. Look at this. What owns your thoughts? What owns your soul? What owns mine? But be careful. They profess to be wise. False teachers always attack the Word of God and replace it with their... Uh, and my computer in there, when I had this, because I took a thumb drive here and put it on my other computer in there, I shrunk that to a smaller font. I hadn't shrunk this one yet. It's a 34 to a 28. That's a 34. Oh, well, that's okay. You've got it in your notes. They profess to be wise, and yet they're usually immoral in character, as these proved to be, as it proved to be somewhat in the book of Jude. You could almost teach 2 Peter and Jude together. Together. Almost. But they're not. They're two separate writings. False teachers profess to be wise, yet they are usually immoral. They are pernicious in their motivations. That is, they are not satisfied with their beliefs. They feel the need to drag others to their level of hatred for the Word of God. They always attack the Word of God and or try to add to the Word of God with their own writings, their own sayings. How many people have tried to say, what about the epistle of Timothy? What about the epistle of Barnabas? What about Third Peter? There's a third Peter. What about this? What about that? we got enough. We can't understand this sometimes. They want to add more. Not to add to the Word of God, which is wrong, but to confuse people. That's the point. They say if God is so real, then why doesn't He do something about the state the world is in? Well, if you look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, God did that one time. It's called the flood. <laughs> and He's going to do it again if you look at verse 12. He's going to do it, dissolve the world with fire. Now, do you want a flood? Do you want everything you have and will ever be possessed, consumed with fire? It will happen in time, at the end of the millennium. You want that to happen? I mean, it's going to. They didn't believe the flood was going to happen, but it did. Now, he's saying God's going to judge one day. The world didn't know exactly when, but God knows he's going to do it with fire. And we'll get into the atomic fission and fusion argument there when we get to that. Big recycle bin type of thing, you know. Big, we'll make sure you get your hair done before you go. But we'll look at these things. People attack these things. They don't believe they're real. But they want God to judge other people for their sins. But they don't want God judging them for theirs. Well, I'm gonna tell you, God's already been ju already judged for their sin. It's called Calvary. Turn to Jesus if you want to change. And there's so many people want God to... They, they hate God because of the evil in the world, but they won't turn to Jesus Christ and quit their own evil. They have 
made righteousness relative so that theirs is not that bad. They're not that bad of a person that God would do that to them. That they say if God is so real, why does that he do something about the sad state the world is in? In essence, they blame God for death. They, Wait a minute. God said, they you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. So God warned them not to do it. Now it's on us. But it's God's fault somehow. Because God gave them a choice. That's not a fault. That's an opportunity. I had an opportunity to help somebody, but I knocked them down instead. That was a choice. You know? It's a bad choice. Many blame God for the state the world is in. And some have gone so far as to say He doesn't exist. That He doesn't care about us anymore. And so rather than trying to help, they become more violent. Many blame God for our sinning and the results of our sinning actually is humanity's fault. Christians have proclaimed for 2,000 years that the Lord is coming back to fix this world. And He is, as He promised. But where is He, the scoffers ask in chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. They said, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and say, where is the promise of His coming? Y'all said He was coming back. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Not necessarily because there was a flood since the beginning of the creation. Forget about that one. Oh yeah, the Epic of Gilgamesh. If you don't read the Bible, read that. All the others. Uh, there's so many old historical writings of the flood that are extra biblical writings it was one of the biggest events that was ever recorded afterward because Noah's sons and daughters-in-law and his grandchildren they told the story and it was passed on and on and on and those unbelievers they didn't look at it as something that was you know, they believed it at that time even but eventually people fell away they became infatuated with sins and everything else all the things that happened but there's scoffers today that don't believe the Scripture, and Peter deals with it, but he doesn't overly deal with it, but he does deal with it. And he's trying to tell these believers, know the Bible, trust the Lord. He's, I'm going to go with the Lord, be with Him very soon, as Peter said, and y'all will be coming not long behind me. Persecution was terrible. So you got a little outline, you got a little a heads up on what we will look at, and we'll get into that, Lord willing, in Sunday school. We'll get Starting chapter 1. Alright, let's pray. Father, thank You for Your love and Your care. Thank You for Your mercy. Thank You for truth that sets us free, liberates our souls from ignorance, liberates our souls from being held captive by false ideologies that often migrate and operate within the realm of Christendom. Help us, Father, to understand that you know the answer to all of our needs, that your word gives us the light and the guidance that we need with your spirit to see right from wrong, truth from error, to realize that we're only here for a short time, to realize that we all have a shelf life, we have an expiration date stamped in heaven. You know when that day is. You know when that time is. Father, we don't fear it now because we are in Christ. We don't fear death. We don't fear the grave because you know we're not going to remain there. We know that absent in the body present with the Lord, that's a wonderful thing. So we don't fear it. But we know there are an awful lot of people that do who try to cover it up with, with their work, try to cover it up with their family, try to cover it up with their hobbies, try to cover it up with drugs or what have you their activities. But in their heart, they know that something's not right. And they fear leaving because every time they drive by a graveyard, they're reminded that they're not soon for long for this world. Even if it's up 50 years or 75 or whatever. Father, we're thankful that we're not afraid anymore. Your love has driven fear out of us. Your light has driven darkness and, and, and wickedness out of us. And we're so thankful that you love us and you take, you've taken us in. You've adopted us forever. Thank you so much for that. 
And if Jesus Christ should come back tonight and rapture out his church before the wars began, brings his ambassadors home before the battle began for the tribulation period, for the dominance of the world, for the destruction of mankind, that Jesus will come back in seven years and set up his kingdom after he's judged the nations and the wickedness that's on the earth at that time. We are thankful that we know that, Father. And now we ask you bless us and bless our fellowship in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.